So today we are going to talk about uh, another um, lecture on feature extraction. Uh, we will focus on two topics here. One is called the handcrafted features, the old features, uh, features that you would normally think that they're already in the museum. Okay, and then something that you can use nowadays called the deep feature. So we, we will touch on both. Um, if you try to uh, recall the, uh, the roadmap of our course, uh, we are currently in the middle of the part two of our course, uh, which talks about supervised learning for classification. And we spent a lecture talking about uh, this linear separability issue, and then we now uh, talk about uh, different feature analysis techniques. Last lecture, we talked about a, a very old method. It's called the principal component analysis. And today, we are going to talk about uh, more towards the computer vision side. Uh, that's about deep neural networks, how do you pull the features from there, and then before the deep neural network age, uh, what are the available methods. Uh, here is the outline for um, today's lecture. Uh, I want to spend uh, very quickly on uh, some little history on uh, feature extraction. And then I want to uh, spend maybe another five minutes to talk to you about convolution. Something that uh, I bet everyone have learned uh, if you're an EC student. Now, if you're not an EC student, that's also okay. We will, we will go through that. It's, it's fairly easy, okay? Uh, and then I will highlight some interesting facts about convolution, something that you probably don't know about convolution. Um, and then I will talk about uh, two types of feature extractions that have been there uh, since 1990s uh, before the deep neural networks. One is called the uh, shift invariant feature transform. The other one is called the histogram of uh, a gradient. Uh, these are the really principled design uh, methods that are super transparent, that you understand what they're doing. Uh, and then we'll talk about the features, the magical deep neural networks. All right. Okay. So this is a um, slide I got uh, from a uh, article online. Uh, so in this diagram, they are showing a, uh, the history of uh, different types of feature extraction methods. Now, you look at this timeline, it starts from 1999, but this is already just a rough estimate. But because feature extraction, if you trace back, you can trace all the way back to the 80s or the 70s. There are already methods out there. If you, if you treat principal component analysis as a feature extraction, that you can date back all the way for 200 years, okay, by the time of Gauss. Uh, so, so this is a very, very old method. Now, uh, when we look at the, this uh, timeline, we see that there, there is a SIFT uh, method, which we will spend some time talking about. And then there is also a histogram of uh, oriented gradients. Uh, this is another method that we will uh, briefly touch on. And between here and then, this is about 13 years. Uh, and then that's the computer vision uh, community that has been working on. And suddenly after 2012, it, we switched the gear to deep neural networks. And now we think that the deep, the deep neural networks is just so unbeatable that it is everywhere. But that's not the whole picture of uh, feature extraction. And I believe that um, after 2020, there will be new methods coming out beyond deep neural networks, which we just don't know yet. Okay? So do not over overestimate uh, the power of deep neural network. We just need to understand what they are doing and what are the underlying principles of, of them. So there are three things. Uh, PCA we talked about before. Uh, and then today we're going to talk about uh, SIFT and HAWC uh, very briefly because if you really want to know the, the deep meaning of SIFT and HAWC, you better take a computer vision course in, uh, in Purdue is uh, 661 that you will spend a week or two weeks on uh, SIFT and, and HAWC. Um, so we won't be able to touch everything. We, we, we can, I can only uh, highlight the, the basic ideas by showing you a few pictures. Uh, then we will talk about deep neural networks. Uh, how do they pull features from uh, the data? So uh, this lecture will be more geared towards computer vision uh, uh, because uh, all these uh, convolutional architectures, they, are, they were originally developed for computer vision. Uh, the other area that has been uh, using uh, convolution, that kind of approach a lot is natural language processing. 
But beyond that, if you try to talk about medical data, that kind of convolutional architecture may not be the right fit. Okay, so, so, so let's just uh, focus today on the computer vision type of applications. All right, so 2D convolution is what? Well, 2D convolution, of course, it would be a convolution between two signals. Uh, I call the first signal the input signal as F, and then you have a filter I call H. They are both indexed by a spatial coordinate X uh, with uh, uh, X, uh, the first coordinate X1, second coordinate X2. Now, of course, you can extrapolate this idea to, to three-dimensional data, four-dimensional data. That's the same principle. So the convolution is denoted by the symbol. You have a star here. You, you take two functions, F and H. You take the convolution. The definition is, is this integration, where you have this F, and then you have X minus uh, psi. So what it does is that, uh, uh, think about this X. Uh, think about it's a function of psi. And when you put a negative psi in the argument, you, 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 you flip the, the signal left and right over the Y axis. Okay, so flip it over, it becomes a negative sign. And then once you add the x here, then you're shifting it left and right. Okay, so that, that's the meaning of this x of uh, f, x uh, minus psi. And then here you have a h sign, so then now you're taking, the in the, uh, you're taking the prompt of the two, and then you are doing the integration. So that's the meaning of the convolution. And now I want to uh, clarify one thing, that the convolution is not the same as, as a correlation. All right, so convolution, you actually have this negative uh, psi, but for correlation, it's a plus psi. Okay, so, so these are two different things. Convolution says that first of all, you need to flip the signal over, you flip left and right. Okay, so you need to flip it over, and then you shift left and uh, sh shift it over. Okay, so there's a, there's a flip, there's a shift, there's an add procedure. So there's a three-step procedure here. Correlation, you skip the shifting, you, you skip the flipping uh, procedure. Now, um, if you look at the convolution uh, neural networks today, they, they're not doing this, they're, they're doing that. Okay, so it's actually a correlational based operation. So uh, um, uh, just be careful when, when people talk about, yeah, I'm using convolutional neural network, but un under the, that operation, it's actually doing correlation. Okay, so if you want to be exact, it's called a correlation uh, neural network, it's rather than a convolution neural network, because they're doing uh, the, the plus. So uh, if you're still wondering what convolution uh, is really about, in case you are not an ECE student, uh, so here is what I mean by flip. Let's say you have a function f, and then it's indexed by this uh, signal psi here. Um, by flipping, I literally mean that you flip the signal uh, over the y-axis. Okay, so here it's increasing. Now if you flip it over, it becomes decreasing. This is uh, f of minus psi. Uh, and then if you uh, add a uh, x to this minus psi, then you're shifting it left and right, depending on the, on, on the size of this x. If x is positive, you shift, I forget it, it's either, either left or right, okay? So you shift left and right. And then uh, you multiply your f by your h, okay? And then this is a point-wise multiplication, and then you add them up. Then you will get the output. So the output would be uh, one value for one pair of uh, x and uh, f and h. And it's, as you uh, shift the x around, you get all the numbers. So here is a two-dimensional uh, illustration. Let's say this is your underlying image, and then this is your filter. You overlap this filter with the image. You you multiply each number one by one. You add them up. That will give you a number here. So why is this case? Let's say you have five ones here, and then in this red box you have uh, you have six ones here, and then you count how many of them are overlapping, and there are four of them that are overlapping, and so this box would return you a four. That's how you do the convolution. And then you you slide this red box around, then you can fill up this uh, uh, output. Um, so this operation is called a convolution. It's a very simple operation that can uh, help you Extra features. Now I'll go to that point later. Um, so when you think that, if you think that you know convolution a lot, but then I will, I will just remind you there are a couple very, very interesting properties of convolution that you might have missed uh, when you study uh, uh, linear systems. Uh, the whole idea of convolution is the concept of shift invariance. Uh, this, this, this is really the core concept of convolution. Why do you have this? flip, shift, and add operation is because of this linear shift invariance. Now, the correlation doesn't really capture this notion. Okay, so, so, so the reason why you really need, 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 need to flip it over and shift and add is because these two, one, you need to, you need to have linearity 
you, when, you, when you put two functions in, you need to add them up. Uh, you, you need to ensure the linearity works. So that, that's the first part. The other one is the, uh, is the shift invariance. Okay? So it, it means that if, if you shift your input by certain amount of psi, the output has to also shift by certain amount of psi. All right, so, so, um, um, and you also need to think that, uh, what do we mean by impulse response? Impulse response is actually the underlying driving machine that, that, that shifts the signal to the left and the, to the right. Uh, there's also a reason why we want to uh, use the convolution rather than the correlation. It's because of the, another property, that the eigenfunction of a convolution is actually the Fourier series. Okay, so what is an eigenfunction? If you have a function, so you have a black box, that's an operator. You dump a function in, it gives you a function out. Uh, if you send fun some function into that black box, it comes out as a scaled version of that same function. That's, that function is called the eigenfunction. All right. So for for any LSI system or LTI system, uh, the, the the convolution will guarantee that uh, that the function is is, is an eigenfunction. Okay. So so that's very important because if you don't really get this point, then you don't really know where does this convolution come from. Uh, convolution is sort of the only possible function that can meet this criteria. Okay. If you don't if you, if you don't use convolution as the underlying um, uh, operation for that system, you cannot really ensure these two. You can probably get linearity. You, you, I bet you cannot get this um, uh, shift invariance. So that's the reason why we really need both uh, shift and linear invariance to, to really motivate this uh, uh, idea of convolution. Um, okay, so flip operation is necessary to define the Fourier series. And this convolution ha can be really traced back to, to the 17th century. It, it's, it's a very, very old idea. And so if anyone thinks that convolution is invented after the deep neural network, that, that's totally wrong, okay? Because convolution has been here since the day of, of Fourier transforms. It, 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 you can go all the way back for 300, 200 years. Um, okay, so uh, convolution with large filters is always implemented by uh, fast Fourier transforms. Okay, so um, convolution you don't have to implement using the, the, the shift and add operation. If you have a large kernel, uh, just turn both into a Fourier domain and then do the cal calculation in the, in, the, in the fast Fourier domain. Okay, now the last point is also very uh, interesting, perhaps no one, uh, not everyone knows, that you can actually do convolution in the speed of light. Okay. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you set up an optical bench, and then you put your object right at the focal length of your lens, and then at the other focal length of your lens, put your, 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 your plane here, and then when you look at the image, it will be the Fourier transform of the uh, original uh, the image. Yeah, there's a video, tip, uh, video YouTube here, okay? So, so that's called the Fourier optics. We have another course on this thing. It's uh, EC513, okay? So that will show you how can you actually do the... Um, do the convolution at the speed of light. And the principle is that when, when, when the wave propagates from one point to another, that, that, that Maxwell equation, that magical thing, with somehow, with a lot of approximations, uh, is going to do the Fourier transform for you. Okay? So, uh, many years ago, uh, there was a paper saying that if you want to do, uh, uh real-time, uh, object tracking, what you can do is that you can put a, uh, a mask, a binary mask of, uh, there's a whole, uh, in front of the camera, and then you have you have different uh, phase alternation, and by doing that, you can get the you, whenever light comes in, it will give you a, a edge mask. Okay, so you have plus one and minus one. You just encode it properly, and then when the light comes through your mask, you will get the Fourier transform of the uh, the mask. And then if you put it all um, set it in the right right position, you can do another inverse Fourier transform to get the image. So you can get a the edge map immediately at the speed of light from the scene. So that can be done uh, using convolution. Uh, so this is a very interesting thing. Now, uh, to us, what is interesting is the uh, effect of this convolution. So um, um, let's say these are your uh, filters. Okay, so these are your filters. And these are your images. And let's say we try to uh, filter uh, these images using these uh, uh, filters. Then you, uh, you flip it over, but since this is symmetric, it doesn't really matter where you, where you flip it upside down or left and right. Uh, so, uh, uh, then in this case, correlation is the same as your convolution. Uh, you, you convolve, uh, this image with this, uh, response, then you can get this image. 
you convert this and that one, you get this, this and that, you get that, okay? But now you notice one very interesting thing. Uh, if you look at uh, this pattern, it's a brick pattern, it has a lot of vertical lines, right? If I convolve it with uh, a kernel that is vertical, I can sort of pull out all the vertical lines. See that? Right? So I can sort of pull out all the vertical lines. Now, if I convolve this image with, with a uh, diagonal lines, I'm not getting much uh, meaningful response. Right? So, so you can treat this convolutional operation as a, like a feature extractor. If I want to get vertical lines, I just pass my, my, my vertical filter to the image and I get a response. The response should be very, very strong along the vertical lines. If, if it's a vertical line image and then I pass a horizontal kernel uh, through that, I shouldn't get anything. Right? So, so it's like a, like a feature extractor in, in, in this perspective. Um, there are um, many types of uh, filters that you can use. Uh, one of the more famous one is called the Gabor filter. This filter has uh, orientation and also has magnitude. So you can uh, change the angle of the filter. You can also change the uh, magnitude of the filter. In this case, it would be the spread of the filter. So then you can, by, by sweeping through a range of the angles, by sweeping, by sweeping through a range of these magnitudes, you can, you can cover the entire space of rotation and also the size. Okay? Then you can get different features according to uh, these patterns. Uh, another Gabor filter is here. Uh, you can extract patterns like this, or that, or that, uh, and, and, and patterns like these. So by using each one of these uh, small filter, you will be able to get a feature response that will look similar to these. Uh, there are more filters. Uh, so this is called a, a KSVD filter. So you can have a very uh, low resolution, uh, uh, low scale, uh, uh, filters, and then you have a much more higher level uh, scale uh, um, uh, filters, and then this is the mid-scale uh, filters. So by, by filtering the image using different uh, uh, of these filters, you will get different responses. So you can have a hierarchy of different, different, uh, different uh, responses. Okay? So now uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, so it, how, how do you get the, if, if my image is a, um, is a box, okay? So this is my box. Uh, what do I get? Uh, what, what would be the outcome when I when I convolve it with a um, let's see uh, a horizontal a horizontal edge, okay? How about uh, one and one mi minus one, okay? So this notation says that I have uh, a pixel that is one on the left and then minus one on the on the right. So two two pixel uh, filter. So if I do this convolution, then the output would be what? Uh, you, will, you will get two lines. You will get one line here, you will get another line here. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, so here you will get a negative edge, here you will get a positive edge. Uh, now if I convolve it with, um, let's say I, I do it here, so same image, and then I convolve it with uh, one minus one, uh, then I will get what? Then you will get a, a positive edge here, negative edge here. You see that? Okay. So this is what I really mean by add, extracting the information, extracting the features. Now you can also try to convolve this image. Uh, how about with a, a image of this pattern? Okay. So let's say this is your kernel. Okay. Instead of using one minus one, you, you use this kernel. You try to convolve with that. What will you get? Well, you will, you will get a lot of response at here. You will get some response in the middle, but you wouldn't get much response at the, at the side, right? So that would be, that, that would be like a, like a, like a corner extractor for you. Okay. All right. So this is the uh, beauty of convolution. And now you're trying to map to your convolutional deep neural network. It, it's actually doing something similar here. 